This podcast is part of the Big Heads Media Podcast Network. Go to BigHeadsMedia.com for more great podcasts. Hello, and welcome to Body Count, the podcast where we believe history doesn't repeat itself. It rhymes in a member of the Big Heads Podcast Network. We're here to show you you don't hate history. You just hate the way that it was taught to you. Only rule when we choose a topic, someone or a lot of someone's died. We give you the series of events in a narrative fashion, and by the end, correlate said story with current events. Now, I'm not PBS, Ken Burns, or Dan Carlin. If you want to hoover us just the Facts Ma'am History podcast, we are not going to be for you. I.e., there will be analysis, opinions, and this is not a lecture. My opinions are my own. Know that I hold my co-hosts verbally hostage. Direct your hate at me where it rightly belongs. Uh, it said tragedy plus time equals comedy. No, we giggle at some occasionally rough subject matter. We are not actively trying to offend anyone. You've been warned. If you're okay with all of that spiel, I'm your host, Jessica Manor. And I'm joined today by my guest and co-host. Bevan is guilted. Hey. <laughs> it's been forever for here. We've made it. Kind of. It's three weeks. It's three weeks out. Sorry, everybody. We had to set up our kids' homeschooling, like, indoor oh classrooms. And, of course, it's the shit show that I assume any parents and or listeners that have wondered or been a part of know exactly what kind of shit show yeah. that we're dealing with. It is what it is. Welcome to... Post-COVID America, I guess. I, guess. I mean, honestly, Jess, I, I, I always wanted to be a stay-at-home parent, but this is not the same thing. This is not even close to the same thing because a stay-at-home parent gets their kid up, sends them off to school, and then they have the rest of the day to do everything. To get, to get everything they need to get done. They don't have to sit for the duration of school and then get everything that you need to get done afterward. Oh, mm -hmm. And my first day of my kids homeschooling, they send them on a scavenger hunt. And I am an absolute neat freak so that everybody knows. Everything's got to be in its place. Everything belongs in said place. It needs to be clean. So I... Five minutes into this, I'm just giving dirty background looks to these teachers because now I've got a pile of shit that's been drug out of every basket in the house and wherever. You know, things that are round or have short A sounds or God help me, I've got like a bat or a snow globe and it went on forever. And just the more and more. But then the best part is you can see all the other parents. And I see other bitches like giving the stank eye to these teachers <laughs> through the deal as well. Like okay. my kid's young, so she can't just be by herself. Right. Well, see, it's so funny that you said that because actually we started. I mean, obviously, our our kids started a week before yours, yours did. But on the first day, all she really did was, you know. It was a lot of icebreakers, but it was like, find one object that describes you. And like, for instance, I'm holding up a beer can. How, uh, okay, this beer can is like me because it's fun. It's crisp. I have a, okay. I have a it, glass with vodka, you know. I'm very refreshing, just like this ice cold beer. I'm always the party, the fun of the life of the party. Okay, you know, <laughs> my son, he did a basketball and he did a great job, but you know, that was it. And then they took a test like three days in because, you know, they're so behind. And I'm like, I cannot get over how many times I could hear this poor teacher. All right, class, remember, if I don't call your name, you need to make sure you mute yourself. Okay. Uh, <sighs> can can we I'm mute like, ourselves? Let's all mute. God, how many right. times I'm tired of hearing mute. Who hasn't muted? Remember, if you, if you were not talking, you need to be muted. I can I can mute you all, but it takes a while to figure out who's not muted. So if you want, can you please? And I swear to God, I was like, girl, I'm gonna get you so much wine or supplies or both, whatever you need. Because <laughs> I don't think I could say it nicely that many times in an hour, let alone hours upon hours during the day. 
And uh, okay, so we're obviously not in a traditional classroom setting. Maybe let's not call on kids. Let's just present the material, you know, and let's let's do what we got to do. I don't think that continual distraction helps anybody, but whatever. I'm not, not a teacher for obvious reasons. Obviously. Yes. Um kids and parents, thank God that you are. So yeah. Because coming from somebody that never wanted to do this, I'm already, like, I'm a weekend and I'm ready to, like, wrap my lips around a barrel, okay? I'm done. I'm ready to eat that bullet. Like, I'm done. I'm done. Uh, try, managing, try managing three at one time. That's Absolutely shit. not. There's not enough hard drugs on the streets. <laughs> <laughs> there's There's not enough. I'm sorry. There's not enough prescription medication manufactured in the United States to get me through that. You'd have to put me out like you were flying one of those Southwest mini horse companions. Okay. Like that's where I'm at. So uh, as always, we have a lot to get to today. First housekeeping. We are part of the big heads podcast network, a great collection of podcasts. We're super excited. Go check them out on social media. Everyone at Big Heads Media on Twitter and BigHeadsMedia.com. If you love the show, go and give us those five stars on iTunes or wherever it is that you listen to podcasts. Say whatever you like. Um, it helps us out on the business end. To that note, our Patreon's up and running. We're about to get some other things going. You can watch us record some past episodes on there currently. We'll keep you updated kind of via social media. Be sure to follow us there. And we'll let you know where to follow us at the end of the show. So, are we ready to get weird? Yeah, so real quick, when I saw the title of this, it's, it's you say it. If you go, I go. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> oh, we are talking about the Fugo today. And if you don't know what that is, by the end of this episode, you will. Yeah, what the Fugo is, but if you go, I will go. <laughs> I go. <laughs> God. I couldn't resist. I'm sorry. I know it's so late, And but. there's this week's episode title. <laughs> Who go? I go. Oh, so we ready to get weird? Mm. Sorry, I was swallowing, but yes, let's, let's get, get weird. Get- <laughs> <laughs> I'll <be> swallow. <laughs> sorry, mom. <laughs> Always swallow. It's just respectful not to, right? <laughs> mm. uh, okay, like we've wet the whistles. I like how we both swallow at the same time. That's teamwork, yep. right? <laughs> mm, that's fucking teamwork. Yeah, that got a double drink out of me because I'm trying not to laugh and get weird like right before we even begin this. We got a lot of pages to go <laughs> for that. Um Like we said, weird one today, even for this show. So cut to 1944, 1945, U.S. soil, where it is like hard and heavy wartime. Mm -hmm. There is a world war going on. The second one in so many years, if you will. Uh, If you've not followed this far in the story, go ahead, back on up, have a read, pick up any books about uh, the 40s. You know, and then get back to us. And I assume most of you are with me. So let's continue. Paranoia is rampant. Things are weird. The United States military is looking like right and left for another attack on U.S. soil. There was a really big one. Not too, not too far back. Couple years. Go ahead and give that a a look-see as well. Um, Again, rough one. It's Pearl Harbor. Yeah. Uh, again, if it's new to you, go back, listen to our early episodes. That's our first, literally our first two episodes is on Pearl Harbor. So. Exactly. So this massive, strange, widespread reports are trickling up to the United States military forces that have the boys in uniform asking themselves, Bethany, what in the fuck? And slowly. A fantastic story starts to come together, stranger than fiction, as fragments of paper and metal 
start to accompany these stories, right? So they're getting these strange groups of artifacts coupled with some of these stories. So let's get to a little taste of what the military is hearing through the old civilian grapevine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. A father. What the fuck? What the fuck? What the fuck? So a father and son are out on this Andy Griffith style early fishing trip. Uh, (laughs) Little Opie's skipping rocks. Everybody's wandering around. It's the 40s and we're having a good time. (laughs) So they're settling in, pulling out the poles, getting them wet. (laughs) <laughs> when they see <laughs> they see this bizarre what are you talking about there <laughs> just a, just a classic father son fishing trip <laughs> oh my god we is that there. not what happens uh, i've been watching the wrong movies then um so they see this bizarre balloon or parachute like object drift quiet as a church mouse, over their position and behind a nearby hill. And just when they settle in with a uh, not-so-business attitude, right, the sound of an explosion echoes around the valley. The sound came from behind the hill where said ghost balloon disappeared. Mm -hmm. So the two reached the area to find paper fragments to be raining down like money in an 80s movie, right? Like, I don't know. It's cash grab, basically. But there's paper fucking everywhere. And this was the only, you know, not the only sign that things were not business as usual in yeah. this normally silent valley. Um, trees are everywhere. It's some kind of massive explosion has occurred. And they're going, what the fuck is this? So they report it. Blah, blah, blah. It's one story, right? Seems a little seems a little weird, but there are going to be more stories that uh, will grab your attention. Like two farmers are out just plowing a field like old pros um, when they're suddenly interrupted by the sound of an explosion and a cloud of yellow dust a few fields over. So they, you know, like amble on over in classic farmer fashion i'm sure one has a toothpick or a grass a sort of grass that they are chewing some sort of early levi's sort of (laughs) you know one fashioned overall i like to paint a picture let's paint the picture exactly there they may be into some sort of seed in which they are spitting i don't know I don't know. I don't speak farmer, but they amble over to find nothing more than a giant hole in the ground accompanied by nearby metal fragments. Um, And they are plum baffled as there was no, (laughs) there was, I know, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, There's no evidence to account for either the sound or the mysterious metal objects. Again, they didn't see anything. They just kind of heard it. So, cut to a mother tucking her son into bed when out of nowhere she sees a blindingly bright flash out of the window followed by the sounds of an explosion. The (laughs) silence and darkness returned with no further incident. And this woman had the good sense not to go out in the night and investigate good for her lock those doors draw those windows get shotgun girl your man's gone to the war i'm sure right uh, like come on now i hate those people like what's that strange sound i'm gonna go check it out no. exactly she it's just like locked doors. it up pulled the curtains called to report it good girl so few ranchers are at the top of the hill at their previous night's camp. And they are surprised to encounter a partially inflated balloon tangled in some scrub brush. It contained nothing. Whatever it had been carrying, having dropped at some point along its journey through the wilds of the West. It's a ghost. It's a ghost balloon. It's a ghost, ghost balloon. Ghost balloon. 
it, I tell you what, a ghost blew in it. I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, it came over in the night sky. It was glowing, and then boom. <laughs> Eddie, I was just trying to. I was just trying to cuddle up with Bill in our sleeping bag. We'd had a lot of beans. It was cold out at night. Next thing we fucking know, here come this ghost balloon. And I don't know what. I can't make heads or tail of it. <laughs> but it blew so, up. It shook, us, it shook us right in the night. Shook us. Shook us. I thought it was Bill getting fresh with me, but uh, <laughs> I knew how to quit him. So it was something else. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so odd goings on even for the western united states folks so let's jump ahead a bit in our story and dive headfirst into our body counts so we're going in the future and then we're going to come back right so may 5th yeah into the back to the future roads we don't need roads taking a story road to a magical mind journey in history. So, May 5th, 1945, Pastor Archie Mitchell has promised his wife, Elsie, a treat, some good, old-fashioned, Jesus-approved fun in the great outdoors. So, (laughs) you know, they're bored. They're tired of sitting around listening to the radio and reading the newspaper articles about the war in the East. It's 1945, there was no Netflix and chill to be had, and even world wars become mundane and routine after a couple of years, turns out. So, the two get it in their heads to drive up to the mountains of southern Oregon and get back into, like, the picnic scene as if they are a couple of modern-day hipsters. They would Instagram this shit if it was today, right? (laughs) <laughs> selfies <laughs> let's stand selfies up take a picture let's wait till the sun's going down so all you see is our silhouette eating a picnic yeah that's where they're at all right so elsie she's hashtag pumped and archie even consents to her inviting a few of the children along from the sunday school class she teaches right so elsie's about five months pregnant And she is all about that kid prep, right? She's into it. So she's kid crazy. Elsie can't get enough kid in her life, which is the only explanation I have for taking five children that are not yours on a picnic. Yeah. But also, very different time in 1945 when it was not weird that two childless adults not related to you were, like, allowed to take your kid on a rando forest picnic. And not only that, but it feels like it should have been, like, I don't know, just the two of them. But yet she wanted to take five kids that weren't hers with her. That makes a zero sense. And honestly, it weirds me out. <laughs> it was 1945. People I mean, were I, different. I get that, but to an extent, you know, it's definitely one of those things where I'm like, um... Like, bitch, you're about to not get any rest. You're about to have a child. Although, they make that shit look easy in 1945. So, what the hell do I know? Yeah. You would think that I was Jesus of Nazareth carrying the cross, being a mother of one. So, God, good for you, Elsie. Good for you. You have the drugs we have now, so... Oh, right. Goodness. Actually, no, they had better ones. They had like cocaine and their actual coke. So, you know what? If I was like all coked out and pregnant, I'd be like, yeah, let's take the whole Sunday school class. I don't care. Mountain hike and have a picnic. Right. Yeah. Let's just go. Let's go on a big ass hike, picnic, do whatever we're going to do. So, they set out by car in the late morning and Archie's meandering, taking in the scenery, but as we are not surprised, it does not take long for five children to get restless. As anyone that has been in a car with small children will know. Kids, you noticing all this flight? This will just uh, make us appreciate what we have. Roll them up. It takes even less time for Archie to get sick of listening to that shit. And they come to the head of a hiking trail just in time. 
Um, they, they are close to the picnic location. Archie stops and suggests Elsie grab the kids and they hike the nature trail up to the desired picnic location at okay. the foot of Leonard Creek. So okay. Archie drives on and he starts prepping the lunch while Elsie and the kids are hiking to the spot. Wow. Right. Well, he sends his pregnant wife with five kids to hike by herself. Fuck, I'm just impressed that he's going to lay out the food, right? I mean, <laughs> be surprised that he's doing that. <laughs> That's pretty progressive for 45. I mean, yeah, true. Well, it was either lay the food out or watch the kids, but I think he'd rather do the servant butler type thing than... Well, that's all right. She's on Kitapalooza journey. It was her idea to invite the little son of a bitches in the first place. So, you know, she can watch him. Exactly. Her her problem now. (laughs) Exactly. So Archie is rocking this picnic spot, right? Like he's unpacking like a champ, doing some serious food prep when he hears the children Shouting, and you know how tweens are when they find something super exciting and they rush down to where Archie is unpacking to tell him they oh, have made leaf. Look, I found a leaf. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. They rush down to tell him they've made a discovery, though. So they tell him about a strange balloon they found lying on the ground just a short distance from the picnic site. Archie promises to come and check out the strange discovery just as soon as he finishes unpacking their lunch but not before issuing a stern warning concerning the balloon he warns the children not to touch the balloon under any circumstances it could be dangerous yes Oh, Archie was proved right on this yeah. point and at very great cost Yeah, I was going to say, the moment you tell a child, don't touch it, I don't don't feel like this story is going to go. No, it's not. It would be body count if it was, right? (laughs) So just as soon as Archie rose and set off in the direction indicated by the children, the ground under his feet is rocked by a massive explosion. Shockwaves kick up a ton of dust. Archie rubs his eyes and manages to see this black plume of smoke rising through the trees in the direction he was headed. Finds his footing, rushes toward the area where he sees the trees are singed and in shreds. Archie then discovers something far worse than overcooked flora and fauna. He finds his 26-year-old pregnant wife, Elsie, Dick Patsky, 14, Jay Grifford, Edward Engen, Joan Patsky, all 13, and Sherman Shoemaker, 11, covered in blood and dust. They all would die from their injuries. And this unfortunate picnic group of six makes up today's body count. So, riddle me this, Batman. What kind of balloon breaks up a party? <laughs> I wasn't ready for that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's really dark, and I got really depressed, so I asked a really horrible question. I'm uh, sorry. Like, it's not a gun <laughs> I'm so sorry, y'all. I'm drunker than usual for this. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm a horrible human being. Um, Because, right, parties usually, you know, balloons get a party going, right? Um, Hey, party here. (laughs) Party right Right? here. (laughs) Boom. I've never seen anybody go, oh, balloons. eh." (laughs) Death and destruction. Balloons. Opposite of a party. Honey, look, they're having a sale on mattresses. How do you know? There's balloons going on over there. There's <laughs> balloons. Like, balloons are general indicators of good things. A balloon do all colors. Do they float? Oh, yes. They float, Georgie. They float. And when you're down here with me, 
You float Unless you are this picnic group. Um, but like I said, while a balloon usually gets a party going, I do not think there has ever been a group of balloons as metal as the Fugo or the Fusen Bakudan. These the balloons carried four incendiaries and one 30 pound highly explosive bomb. But a better question is why? Yeah. <laughs> What was the point of it? I mean, no, I mean, no, I get the point of it. What's the point of it now? I guess the point of it now. Well, where'd they come from? What is the fucking story, right? So let's get into it, folks. We have to go a little further back, though. Um, But just for a moment. Sure, and then now we're going in the past. Yeah. We are back to the future and the fuck out of this. This is like all the Back to the Future movies in one episode. Yeah, except for if you added a killer balloon. <laughs> <laughs> Which, quite frankly, is what the franchise was missing. Yes. Um, <laughs> they were one fucking balloon short. They were one fucking balloon short. <laughs> Of more money than the franchise even made the first time around. All right. Reboot with a killer balloon. Just saying. Um, So so like I said, we're going to go back for a minute. Specifically to the Doolittle Raid. So basically, and I am going to put this in the simplest terms. And all you history jackers out there can blow me. I don't care if you want to get on our fucking Twitter and tell people about the Doolittle Raid, you know, jizz yourself out. I don't care. So basically, Doolittle Raid was a raid that stood as the initial answer to Pearl Harbor. I think we can all agree we had a much rougher one a couple of years later. Um, right. But it was just a quick ditch effort answer to kind of destroy some Japanese industrial centers, necessities, you know, like Things were places where things were manufactured, yada, yada. Um, And and more importantly, and I know I'm really stuffing it into this less complicated bag. You don't have to tell me. It demonstrated to Japan that Japan was indeed vulnerable to American air attack following Pearl Harbor. You know, it's that we have to do something. In this case, it was a minor raid. You know, they didn't go declare war in Iraq. (laughs) (laughs) just because we were pissed, you know? It was a different time and a better-gauged reaction. Uh, (laughs) So, (laughs) Cough, cough, no. Cough, cough. Now we know um, just how true that uh, eventuality would become, you know? (laughs) Japan was very vulnerable to a couple, a set of air attacks, if you will, but we're not here to talk about that today. So let us back up to a pre-atomic sitch for just a mo, right? So we have to jump back and forth a bit here in time to kind of understand the one, the most important information about the Fugo was destroyed. And what we do know post-war, it was a post-war interview. So this is going to kind of be fun. And two, um, it's, it's not something that's easily looked at A to B to C in the case of this story. So, okay. y- you know, because we're jumping back and forth, we have all this mixed information. So it's a lot of he said, she said, we don't have actual documents from Japan. They were destroyed. We'll get to that later. So what we know from interviews as the Japanese military scientific laboratory was uh, uh, they had originally conceived of the balloon bomb idea back in 1933. But initially... Sorry, that's almost like 10... That's over 10 years prior to... Right, that's when everybody was pretending like we weren't going to go back to war. (laughs) But like we were waiting for a generation of people old enough and enough resources to be reaccumulated going, this shit ain't done. And Japan... Turns out was going to change sides uh, because they were real pissed about some things that happened post-World War I. Again, go back to our episodes to find out exactly what. But initially, 
the Japanese had explored several ideas, including the balloon bomb. Uh, please go and see uh, Robert McKish for all the details. I mean, it's really great stuff. I don't normally cite sources, and I'm going to put them all in our show notes. There's a lot of really good stuff out there, and I think this is one that you definitely need to read the sources just because so uh, many other things go into this actual story. So following the Doolittle Raids, the Nobarito Research Institute was charged with, guys, like, how do we retaliate for their retaliation to, like, our initial strike, et cetera, et cetera? (laughs) Like, like, how, how do we, we piss them? back over the fence? We did them first, but they did that to us prior. And but that was because we did that to them. Regardless, how are we going to get them back? <laughs> uh, it doesn't matter how we're going to hit these bitches back where it hurts. Okay. So they literally go back to the old drawing board, the 1931 or 1933 one, if you will, um, and go, ah, here we go. Here we go balloon bombs we have it we have it off the top of our head um being the person that's sitting in the room they're like all right everybody what ideas do we got what come on just start throwing ideas let's let's see um um we could do balloons and then they just they all run with it because they were rejected from the kamikaze program but they're still trying to work the methamphetamines out of their system (laughs) It's like this long, <laughs> awkward pause. Silence. <laughs> Balloons. Balloons. I That's love the it. answer. <laughs> Henry Ford with his bullshit like assembly line. Look at us. Balloons. <laughs> Balloons, motherfucker. So initially they thought, yes, balloons launched from submarines. Which, whatever, we're not going to look at that too hard. Um, But that immediate idea shit out on them after a submarine recall or recall for the Guadalcanal operation in the August of 43. So back to the drawing board again, the Japanese say, hey, why not just a transcontinental weapon, i.e. a weapon that can reach the continental U.S. from Japan. So cut to the winter of 43 and 44. We have some Japanese meteorologists kicking around with some engineers. <laughs> yeah. Fire cannon. <laughs> It'll go Fire down. cannon. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> Believe it or not, they were even more clever than that. So again, these Japanese meteorologists kicking around with some engineers and they are tasked with making these balloons a reality. Floating by the winter jet stream. What? And what do they find? What do they find, Bethany? A balloon could hypothetically travel on average of 60 hours in the good old jet stream. And what do they discover? Huh. Well, a fucking balloon can most certainly reach America. What the? What right? the? Oh my god! They it's pretty use, fucking clever, though. They use the weather against us <laughs> to their advantage. I'm well, blown. to be fair, it didn't take the U.S. military long to start using the weather as a disadvantage either. See cloud seeding in the Vietnam War. I know. I know. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it, it's pretty it fucking first. clever. <laughs> they did it first. <laughs> we did it first with balloons. Okay. <laughs> Right? Straight up. I don't care what anybody says. And yes, it seems full, like, it seems stupid now, but it was pretty fucking clever in the 40s. So I really am. I'm kind of impressed that either, what was the, I mean, I get, okay. Now, in hindsight, if they'd have spent less time with balloons and maybe taken a look at atomic energy. It might have been a different story, but here we are. <laughs> here we are. <laughs> and you know what? I'm thankful it was balloons and not atomic energy. Personally. Well, personally, I am too. But we're going to get into 
What ends up being pretty significant about these fucking balloons, as stupid as it sounds and as all all inspiring as an atomic weaponry may be, actually this is the true future future, as well as the atomic bomb. Uh, you can't have one without the other, turns out, when we're done with the end of this story. Huh. Yeah, and boy, did the Japanese run with this little discovery. Now, they greenlight the F out of this project. Mass production times, right? So, 10,000 balloons are prepped for the winter winds of 44 and 45. Like, it gets real really, really quickly. The balloons themselves are made out of washi, which is a paper made from the bark of the koso trees. So, schoolgirls... From schools near the laboratory were pushed into forced labor to oh make God. these ridiculous origami balloons. And make no mistake, they are a work of art if you if you see them reconstructed. Um they really were. I'll I'll have you post some pics. I've got a lot of pictures from um, Smithsonian archives and some shit that we can use. And they are beautiful. Right, but I can, can you imagine just being a, a schoolgirl like that? And, like, all of a sudden you're making origami death balloons? Like, that's unreal. Like, what, do you, did you, what did you do at school today, honey? Oh, I folded, I folded paper and I made balloons and they're going to go over to America with the winds and blow everybody up. To be fair... <laughs> they didn't tell them what they were actually making. Um, what is so, so pretty? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. They thought they were making an art project for the emperor. Turns out, death balloons. Um, now, <laughs> they were conscripted to make these as part of what was kind of Japan's total war effort mindset happening at the time. Like that was everybody did everything for the war in Japan, right? Right. So, you know... They didn't set them down and say, make these balloons to attempt to attack the U.S. mainland, (laughs) which I don't know if that is better, because at least it sounds a fuck ton more, I don't know, like relevant, better than make these balloons because I fucking said so and you don't need to know why. Like, which do you prefer? (laughs) <laughs> I, honestly, though, honestly, if you were to think about that, I'm having a different thought train or different train of thought. Sorry, <laughs> thought train. Um, you know, what if these kids, you know, these schoolgirls, they weren't told, obviously. And so if you were told to draw or not draw, but like make something, I wouldn't even like. With love from Susie. Like, Susie was here. I would put stars on my, you know, balloon. And, you know, I would decorate with stickers. Like, Hello Kitty. You know? (laughs) I'm just saying. (laughs) Right? No, I get what you're saying. Like, maybe that's what was inside these balloons. Because they do find a significant amount of, like, Japanese markings on them. So, I'm just saying... It's probably well wishes from schoolgirls <laughs> attached to these like thirty pound bombs. Jesus Christ, God! I love the world the way it used to be. <laughs> Have a blast, <laughs> Kiko-san. I've always wanted to come to America. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. Oh, God. That's terrible. That's amazing, though. So, (laughs) cut to November 3rd, 1944. First of the balloons launches. Now, this proved to be a lot tougher than initially predicted because it took 30 minutes a pop to prep one of these bad boys for flight and required about 30 dudes To get it into the air. So that tells you kind of how big these were. These poor little schoolgirl fingers are having to put the 10,000 of these mofos together, right? Yeah, I guess my my mental image I'm having here is like I'm thinking of those like floating lanterns in a sense. Think big ass fucking weather balloons. Okay. Massive. Huge. 
huge, like 30 dudes to settle these. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Hunger Game vibes where, you know, they dropped the parachutes. Like, that's also, like, what's coming across as a mental image. Kind of, but, like, really big. And when I send you the picture, you'll see, like, how massive. Um, Furthermore... The balloons could only launch in certain wind conditions. So, to say the least, these babies didn't come, like, in mass, right? All 10,000 didn't go to the air at once. So, from November to March, there were only 50 favorable days for launching. And they could only launch around 200 of the balloons from three launch sites a day. Nonetheless, that's a fuck ton of balloons, as well we will see, right? And, and despite this shit being coded as top secret in Japan, the balloons were not, obviously, hidden from the areas neighboring the launch sites. Yeah. Again, I mean, obviously. With, like, I don't know, a bomb on it? Like, that isn't... <laughs> doing with that oh yeah hey, check that out <laughs> exactly you'll see they'll see <laughs> exactly it was like this army of these fucking artsy ass balloons with 30 pound bombs attached to them no one missed that not one person um witnesses describe them up and down as giant jellyfish armies in the sky when they were launching. Um, so cut to America. Okay. Now we're on the other side. Right. Well, I was two curious. days. Two days after the launch. A Navy patrol is tooling around off the coast of California. <laughs> and you know like. Battleship. <laughs> battleship. And sees some wonky tattered cloth. Off the coast. Just chilling. Floating there in the ocean. Which is something you notice in wartime. Like, now we're just like, oh, that's probably from the tsunami, right? (laughs) But then it was a big deal because we were in a world war. Nobody should be out here but us. Exactly. We make damn sure nobody's out here but us. So, they reel this bad boy in and see it covered in Japanese markings. And call the FBI. Those are probably well wishes from the schoolgirls, like you said. <laughs> Sorry, we're at war. Can't wait to visit. Um, <laughs> but don't, because you'll be in an internment camp. Uh, two weeks later, more of this weird sea bound debris is found in the military. You know, they start to put it together. Um, In the next four weeks, reports of these weird-ass balloons are blown up all over the place in the western half of the mainland of America, like we talked about earlier. Those sorts of reports are coming in, and that's why they kind of start to put it together. So, back to the stories at the beginning. Again, all these rando explosions, weird shit start happening. So, what does the American military do? Realize... They knew what these were, but they didn't know how many. They didn't know the initial purpose. And more than that, there was a real and a very real fear that the Japanese were loading or going to load these as biological weapons. Uh, Okay. And not only that, we also don't wear because it's all it's been reported all over the place, right? Yeah, uh, up and down the western seaboard, they're going, "What the fuck? Where? Why? What?" <laughs> There's a lot of that going on. Um, furthermore, they didn't know where the fuck they were coming from or how, because it seems pretty impossible, right? Say what you will, but yeah. it was dead clever. Uh. So, they initially suspected these may be coming from Japanese internment, POW camps. Again, it's a different time, guys. We're not here to argue that. Different times. Let's leave it at that. So, December 44, a military intelligence group start, like, looking at the weapons by collecting all the evidence scattered up and down the western seaboard, right? 
Yeah. They take a look at the ballast and find sand that can only be found on the beaches of southern Japan and go, oh, shit. Right? Like, oh, shit. They got it here from Japan. How? Why? What is it? Oh, now we see kind of thing going on. So at very least, this helps to narrow the launch sites because they can identify the sand and the areas it comes from. This is amazing. So, which is amazing because it's 1944, right? Like. <laughs> so it automatically becomes a much more interesting threat. So it's winter. It's a dry season. Forest fires could turn destructive AF and quick at a time when resources in the mainland were limited because, you know, World there's war. a war on. Yeah. <laughs> so that was probably the biggest threat that the military was concerned with when it came to the Fugo, really and truly. Um, but the whole thing is sort of dismissed on the whole because the attacks are hardly concentrated and they're very, very scattered, right? And not only that, but it seems to me like they're finding these things before they go off or, you know, getting duds. Or if it, it feels like, oh, they, they've got more, <clears throat> oh, they figured out what they're doing. Now, you know, well, no a lot of them seem to be exploding on landing. They're ending up in the southwest, weird places. I mean, they blew as far as the southwest. So yeah, they went far. But again, the reports are very scattered. There, a lot of them are probably lost at sea. You know, there are a lot of things. So they're not taking it very Seriously, obviously, yeah. um, because of this, the military made the decision to keep the whole Japanese balloon bomb thing under wraps. They weren't on the whole all that dangerous thus far. Yeah, so far. Yeah. And the powers that be were worried that reports of Japanese weapons <laughs> dropping in and around the mainland sporadically would cause unnecessary panic. Yeah, you, like, you would be like, oh my God, you know, so maybe somebody would see a hot air balloon and get their... And freak the fuck out. And then the next thing, you know, the Air Force is doing flybys on somebody that's goddamn hot air balloon. Exactly. That was the thought. So you kind of also unceremoniously shit on Japanese morale because, you know, they are just salivating by the radio waiting for news of their great victory of their balloon drops like they're just like oh did it, did it work did it work did we get them did we get them are they pissed i mean all in all it is a controversial decision maybe let americans know you shouldn't just go around kicking random parts from balloons and by the way that's what happened in our story yeah. Upon looking at one of the children kicked the bomb. <sighs> yeah, pretty much. So, I mean, it's a controversial decision, but I agree with the decision because of all the things you've said, like mass panic. Everybody's worried about everything at the time. Like, I do think it was the right decision. I really do. So January 4th, 45, the Office of Censorship requests that newspaper editor er, like editors and all the radio bras like look don't discuss the balloons don't look at the balloons you get it all right be cool bras well if you see a balloon call the proper authorities well exactly but they don't have them report on it at all so all these things are also coming into local offices and they're not allowed to report on it huh um this is indeed six su it's successful as the japanese only heard about one single balloon incident in america through a chinese newspaper right so the japanese even tried directly broadcasting to america in english to claim 500 to like ten thousand casualties were inflicted fires Doom and gloom, thanks to the balloons. But, of course, anyone that caught this were like, what? And, it, you know, the propaganda was aimed to play up the success of the Fugo operation. 
more in Japan than it was necessarily in the United States. And it pitched, they, yeah, it was pitched as a prelude to something big. Well, like hello. everybody thought there was this big thing in the works. They, they just forced their, you know, school children to waste their time in making these balloons. So they better. Right. Be, I just wasted a year and a half of my kids' education on this. It was successful. Making goddamn balloons. <laughs> exactly. Stupid scavenger hunt. I'm just saying. <laughs> stupid. Cut to stupid scavenger hunt in my home. Exactly. So the government remained silent until May 5th of 45 and Archie's ill fated picnic. And those deaths, interestingly enough, those killed in the explosion were the only Americans killed by enemy action during World War II in the continental U.S. Wow. Right? Wow. So now these deaths caused the military to go, oh, shit. Yeah, I guess some school kids could wander up on them and fucking kick a bomb, but whatever. And they break their silence. They issued warnings not to tamper with any weird-ass devices found on the ground. And anything found matching that description should be reported. All said and done, 300 incidents were recorded with various parts picked up here and there. But no one else was killed. Oh, my God. So people actually listened. Interesting. Yeah. Because there was a war on. People were real serious about <laughs> shit, okay? <laughs> oh they actually took shit seriously. No wonder. Oh, my God. Okay. Well, and I just have to agree, it was a smarter group of fucking people. Now they'd be Instagramming next to the bomb, you know? Like, you fucking deserve it. Here's my video. I'm gonna touch it. Everybody I'm gonna touch it. I'm gonna touch kick it, guys. Run. Boom. Like, I'm sorry. But yeah. Like the hippies and hipsters are going to kick it and some hillbilly's going to shoot it with a gun. That would be all the Instagram videos. No, the hipsters and the hippies would form a circle around it and say, we must protect this bomb. This bomb did nothing. Leave it alone. Right. And then all the right wing nut jobs are going to gather around oh, and they're going to hit. They're going to hit a bullet with a hammer first, and then they're going to try to hit the bomb with a hammer, right? <laughs> oh, my God. I almost put beer through my nose. Beer, snort, beer, snort. So that is the two sides of America, folks. Um, so <laughs> the closest that the balloons came to causing major shit, and this is important, actually, March 10th. 45 one of the balloons struck a high wire on the bonneville power administration in washington state now the balloon causes a big ass fireball that results in a total power loss on this particular grid which is actually a big ass deal when you consider that the primary consumer of energy on this particular power grid was the Hanford site of the Manhattan Project, which oh, quite suddenly lost power. Lucky for us, we got that nuclear reactor technology right, and overrides prevented our very own little Chernobyl. <laughs> so actually... If we hadn't have gotten it right, the Japanese would have had quite the little balloon bomb victory. So think about that. It's not too stupid of a fucking idea. Because think about that. Like, something goes wrong. We've got an American Chernobyl. Luckily, we got it right. We got it right. Um, good for us. If anything... Later interviews would prove the U.S. military was actually thrilled because the balloons provided the backups and fail-safes that they had for three nuclear reactors, in fact, worked <laughs> like a chip. Um, woo. So, guys, 
that's playing a little more fast and loose than I would like with uh, nuclear power, but uh, disaster diverted, I suppose. Uh, And seeing as they would be dropping bombs on the mainland of America for some time in the future, you know what? That was probably the least of our problems. That all said and done. So, balloon sightings declined sharply by April 45, and by May, the reports had ceased. Now, that takes us to the end of the war, and a team of American scientists set foot in Tokyo to create a report on Japanese scientific research. Now, it is this report that they interviewed officials from Noborito Labs record, like about and pertinent to the FUGO program. Like I said earlier, the records of the FUGO program were destroyed according with directives to like, hey, let's get this this shit, boys, before the Americans stomp on in here. Put it through the paper shredder. The feds are coming. Yeah. (laughs) How very George (laughs) Sr. of you. Save it. Shred it. Shred it. Save it. Does anybody have a cell phone? There's a good chance I may have committed some light treason. <laughs> For real. With the war effort, both uh, on the uh, in Japan and in Nazi Germany, wouldn't have given for. Does anybody have a cell phone? <laughs> Anyone? There would have been a lot less war crime trials. Let me put it that way. Um, so. Fuko, of course, as we'll later find out, thanks to 731 and all kinds of other things, was the least of Japan's worries, as it happens. But a directive is a directive. Um, The official report, therefore, is all we have as a source of information rapping about the goals of the Fugo for the U.S. authorities. Um, Rick and Rick, listen. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) So these critical American bros learned that the Japanese had planned to make up to 20,000 of these bombs. Obviously falling very short of the mark didn't right. jump those hoops so yes. they also learned the campaign uh, like we said was meant to offset that weird imperial japanese base do little shame now according to the interview the japanese had known it wasn't an effective weapon but more of a propaganda game and you know right. Hey, looky here, looky here. Look what we're doing. We've done this. Yeah, no, I I get it. I get it. You know, like basic campaign strategy in 2020. (laughs) Get this message. Um, When no reports were forthcoming from America, the Japanese media made up shit about the weakening, like the weakening of American resolve due to this campaign. So if you want a deep dive militarized plan, again, see the very first episodes of this podcast. They also confirmed, despite everyone flipping their shit, there were no plans to place biological or chemical weapons within the balloons. But I bet they were like then. Fuck. <laughs> right? They were like, oh shit, that was clever. We didn't even think of that. Yeah. They're like sitting in this circle, smoking a doobie, and they're talking about it, and they're like, damn. Why didn't we think of that? <laughs> you know, but since it's like an old school 40s, whatever, you know, they gave them like American cigarettes to smoke in the interview and they're like smoking in the room, telling them everything and they ash. And then, you know, there was like a full five second pause of, fuck, I wish I'd have thought of that. (laughs) Like what we couldn't have done with that. Oh shit, that never occurred to us. 
honestly, it's I still get pissed off back in the days of our college years at West Texas in the early, like close to 2010. Early not. We remember, I remember specifically going, man, I wish other places delivered besides pizza. And look at us now. Look at us now. I wish that other countries had thought of delivering chemical warfare. Like, you know, before Syria. Uh, (laughs) Shit, that's not funny, but here I am. But you know, they're like smoking a cigarette opposite like the budding FBI, OSS, whatever, sitting there going, that would have been a good idea, damn it. (laughs) You Americans, with all your cheeky just like, that is six times. You got us with the atomic bomb, and now you got us with spreading chemical warfare, you bastards. And tally, I guess we'll give you a mark. One for you. Ha 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 Silly us. <laughs> so the balloon program was put on halt, ultimately, before the end of the war, for lack of resources. They were like out of the paper trees. There were barely any left. Uh, a series of American origami, like <laughs> oh shit, our origami balloon paper or whatever is almost out. And like the B twenty nines had bombed the fuck out of a chemical plant, which vastly limited their hydrogen resources, which they would have needed to inflate those. You make the picture. Yeah, the, to make the balloon go and yeah. Okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. You it's the kind picture. Of- there were several things that they were like, mm, this might not be the best use of resources to being a thorn in America's side. So right. if the war had went another year, however, they they also stated they were done with the balloons. It was like a one time thing. It wasn't like a it, it wasn't did- a movement against it was met purely as a propaganda machine so i mean honestly i'll be i'll be completely honest like before you know the picture that you had painted and what they had painted was i was like damn this this seems like it could work is it gonna work like are we gonna just get dropping bombs randomly from parachutes like straight they up had vastly underestimated them the time and the resources it took to deploy that but let's say that they'd had a right count, a body count, if you will, on what it would take to get these balloons in the air, it could have, like I said, it wouldn't have been made like horrific death, uh, like body counts, but they did manage to hit the main power grid sourcing nuclear reactors for the Manhattan Project. So they weren't far off. We just were prepared and got lucky. We call that a hashtag win. Yeah, uh, 110% diverting a, a, an American Chernobyl so that half of Washington state isn't like Priapit. Yeah, i call that a hashtag win. That's 110%. Hashtag. Agreed. Now, to this day, and this is going to be more fun for you, Bethany, to this day, historians, and I agree with this, do not believe that all of the balloons have been recovered. Shut up. Most, most of them probably, most likely, went down in the ocean. Yes. Yeah, but. But be careful, specifically in the Pacific Northwest, based on jet streams where you step. As recently as 2004, a group of Canadian loggers were out logging, having fun in the woods, lumberjack, whatever Canadians do. I don't know. They're lovely people, but they like trees and sap and felling things, right? <laughs> yes, A. <laughs> 2014, a functional balloon bomb is found in Canada. Now, it, it was diffused everything, but it was considered functional, would have like blown somebody's fucking limbs off, 2014. So what? 
This is yeah. from holy crap. A hundred right? years. Hundred it's kind crap. of like good with math. <laughs> it's kind of like an employee of my husband's found like an active grape shot cannon from the Civil War and like brought it back to the office and they were all rolling it around on the fucking desk and I was like, no, no. Touch it. Everybody leave. No. Why don't you just take it outside and hit it with a hammer, hillbillies? Like, see what <laughs> happens? That shit is still explosive. So imagine a 30-pound bomb with four incendiary devices and the incident. Oh, my God. Like, imagine. So 2014, the last one's discovered. My word of advice, uh, be careful if you're Instagramming yourself in uncharted territory. <laughs> now, the balloon would have long since gone away, but if you find a grouping of bizarre metal fragments that might even sort of look like a bomb, don't touch it and log <laughs> into yourself. Don't, don't, it. don't be making your Patagonia or Lululemon commercial and go, what's this? What is this, America? And yeah, then you fucking touch it and it blows your goddamn half of your side off because it's a 30 pound Japanese incendiary device known as the Fugo. And we all know that they don't make them like that anymore. Okay? It no. goes with art, it goes with weapons. It, they just don't make shit like that anymore. Like so, we so. said before, in our atomic bomb survivor deal, this is a person that went to work again two days after surviving an atomic bomb. You don't think they make their bombs fucking? You don't think they come correct with their bomb material? Okay. Enough said. Yeah. Exactly. Bethany's right. They don't make them like they used to because those people were fucking hard, y'all. Yeah. So, like, don't be Instagramming yourself up in Washington State going, oh, my God. Like, look what I all this shit, and it's covered in Japanese markings. It's not a motor from, like, an old Japanese car. Sorry. Don't touch it. Don't it's touch an incendiary it. device. <laughs> it's meant to blow your fucking arm off. So be cool, cubbies. Just be cool. When you're going on your off the record weird Instagram hikes, just say it. Like, I would hate for some modern day hippie chick with dreads to be like trying to sit her ass on it and pose it and be like, oh, I'm so free thinking against an industrialist capital background. And then, <laughs> right? Like, that's what's going to happen. No, she would be on Instagram live and be like, oh my God, you guys protect the environment look what i just found this is unacceptable of the dumping of our foreign country look what i just found dick cheney george w bush even the early clinton administration <laughs> turns out it was like 44 japan bitch sorry <laughs> like that is exactly what's gonna happen i feel like one day somebody on instagram is gonna find one of these so as ridiculous, Bethany, mm -hmm. as this idea has sounded to us as any kind of practical weaponry, right? Right. It's still very much a testament to that wartime awakening as into yeah. almost a second true industrial era, right? Like everything we have now is a byproduct of World War II. All you're enjoying is shit they thought up during the Second World War to defeat enemies. And I'm sure that includes the iPhone I'm talking to you on right now. All right? Like, that's where that comes from. Don't think anybody's really revolutionary. All this shit has been thought into existence way back then, right? And we need yeah. to remember this when we look at an innovative idea, whatever it may be, even today, it may seem inconsequential 
or silly or ridiculous on its face. You know, like those MIT robots that pick up pencils and hand it to somebody. It seems <laughs> a silly thing to us now. But when we look at the Fugo, consider this. The Fugo were, in fact, the first version of an intercontinental ballistic missile. So if any of you are as old as we are, and you remember when you gather around the TV to watch, quote, the war, the Gulf War on live TV, or you hear everybody talking about intercontinental nuclear warheads, i.e. in the Soviet Union, Russia destroys us, we destroy Russia because we can just launch them from sites. That idea originated in the Fugo. It is the first intercontinental ballistic weapon. I mean, ballistic. <laughs> Sorry. It's I love ballistic balloon. Get it? Sorry. No, I was there with you. But oh, you know, okay. you know what I'm saying? Like the fact that the president can push a button now and nuke the fuck out of any country, whatever, and we can point at intercontinental nuclear ballistic missile from the United States, let's say, dead into the heart of Russia or in, into Moscow, that was an idea that even became a possibility because they said, fuck, you know what? We can float this, sh this shit can float in a jet stream. And an idea is born. The idea, purely the idea that we can send bombs or some kind of ballistic weaponry across continents this, this is as silly as it seems was where it all began it's just insane to think about it really is it blows my mind so much that once somebody grasps the idea of using nature against humans it just it's ingenious and <laughs> If we know anything about COVID, that's the most devastating thing you could do in the world is nature against humans, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Call up and phone Africa about how they feel about Ebola, okay? <laughs> Trust or, me. Or Mother a. nature, be a bitch. For real. For real. So that's going to do it for us this week. Guys, so go and check us out on Patreon if you want to watch us record this goofy shit, some past episodes, the Russian ones. We're going to be having some different shit come out here really, really soon now that I'm back on track, focused, have moved back to Virginia, have school settled. This is where we live now. It's patreon.com backslash body count. We post everything there for free. You can hear us anywhere that you listen to podcasts, just search body space count or listen to us on the website at bodycounthistorypod.com. Do us a favor. Just tell one person if you listen to the show and enjoy it about us and tell them why you love this show. Um, just one person. That's all it takes. So you can grab our merch at bigheadsmedia.com, click the history tab or right there. First thing you see, we're reworking our website currently. We're going to have all this in a central space that you can actually go to really, really soon. You can follow the show at Twitter and Instagram at Body Count Pod. We post a lot of on this day and I say we, but I really mean Bethany because I am not that together. So Bethany posts a lot of on this day in history, body counts, but pretty much know. daily. You know, it can be anywhere from two to like 15. It just depends on how metal rock in the day was in history, guys. History was. <laughs> you know, in spring and summer, you see an uptick in the battle shit and you can't be surprised by that because it was favorable battle conditions. For example, in winter, you're not going to see a lot of this battle happened in Russia. <laughs> no. um, honestly, what I have discovered that in in this summertime, this is uh, May is when end of May, beginning of June is when we started on this day. And 
in history and with death and disaster specifically. And what I have discovered that in the summer, it's mainly battles, ship, Navy battles, and race riots. So it is. Um, well, the weather is favorable for both. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's so, favorable for mass warfare from anywhere from the beginning of time to current times, and uh, the hot weather gets people hyped up. And the and the one other thing I'm going to say that I have learned that from the beginning of time to the pretty much close to the present day, a lot that- of a lot of Jews died during this time period every oh, year. Jesus Christ, yes. So, I, I mean, mean not to from invoke Jesus Christ. Oh, from the beginning God, of yes. time, like, <laughs> I have learned that really the Jews, you didn't have it the greatest <laughs> um, for body count wise. <laughs> I've learned that Talk very well, long. my sister. And you know what? That works for the day at the time that we're recording this. <laughs> well, yeah. I am, guys, our apologies to you from all of human history. That being said, um, you know where to find us. You know where to find the show. Bethany, tell people where they can follow and find you. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Bethany Skelton five, the number five. Um, and then you can find me on Instagram at Bethany R N twenty four. And really, I just post selfies and things with my family on there. So, yeah, that's it. What about you, Jay? Yeah, we're boring AF. Uh, you can find me at Jessica, spelled the traditional way. B as in Bravo, M A N O R, like the house, not the behavior. So at Jessica B Manor on both Twitter and Instagram. Don't look at me that way. Sorry, I can see her. You guys can't see that I can see her. She's annoyed at me for using the NATO phonetic alphabet for my middle initial. Like every person you're trying to deal with on the phone, Alpha, Sierra. <laughs> I know exactly what she's being a cunt about. Um, that said, guys, that's going to do it for us this week. We're glad to be back. We will be back, I think, if we don't kill all of our families. <laughs> um, from virtual learning. I feel like the E network and ID are going to have a lot of things to write about in the very near future. Once um once the verdicts have been settled and all the appeals have, you know, been wasted. Uh, that being said, we will see you guys and talk to you guys next week. Well, when we whenever. <laughs> when we get our our shit and we put it into a suitcase Sorry. and pack it all together. We love you. and We love you guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.